Good evening, everyone. We're glad to be back with you again uh, this evening uh, to do our Bible study. And Pastor Samuel will be doing the Bible study tonight. Uh, so we're uh, glad that we can come to the Word of God and know that the Word of God uh, is a living Word and that the Word of God will indeed have a tremendous impact upon our lives even in these difficult times. I trust that you're knowing the Lord's help during these times of difficulty, uh, these times when uh, things are so uncertain, but there's one thing that is certain and one thing that is secure, and that's our God. He's still the same. He's not changed one little bit. And thank God we can depend upon him even at this time. And I trust you're looking to him and trusting his help and his blessing. And if you don't know the Savior, look, say, you should come to him because you need to be saved. You absolutely need to be saved because life is uncertain and we need to know where we're going when this life is over. We need to be prepared. So I'd ask you to seriously consider your ways and turn to the Lord and find salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's unite together for a word of prayer. Father, it is our great joy and privilege again to be able to bow before you in prayer, to be able, Lord, to return you thanks for your mercy and your grace toward us. Father, uh, we thank you that we can call out to you in, a, in, a, in a, an uncertain time. Uh, we have never been this way before. No one has ever been this way before. Uh, things are so uh, uncertain. And uh, Father, yet we thank you that you are still uh, upon your throne, high and holy, exalted far above all. And yet, Lord, you condescend to be amongst your people. Uh, because the Lord God in the midst of us is mighty. And Lord, it's wonderful to know that you are our Heavenly Father. All those who are trusting in you know that tremendous relationship uh, that we are in Christ, and in Christ we have a wonderful access into your presence uh, through the person and work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And so, Lord, we pray for your blessing now upon us today as we turn to your word. May it bring comfort. May it bring consolation to us. We pray, Lord, for those who are in particular need. We do remember Mrs. Madge Archer uh, there in hospital uh, with a very high temperature. We pray, O oh God, that that will very quickly subside and that very, very soon she'll be feeling better again. A protector, we pray. We pray, O oh God, uh, for Mrs. Gwen Crooks as well. We pray that you'll help your child at this time of sadness. And that we pray that you will indeed be a very, very present help in time of need. And we pray particularly for your help for her even tomorrow. Lord, be with the family. May your blessing be upon each one of them. So now, Father, as we have this opportunity to turn to your word, we pray that you make it a tremendous blessing to each and all of us as we listen to it. Bless Pastor Samuel as he opens your truth to us even this day. And we'll give you praise and we'll give you honour and glory because we thank you that you're worthy of all of that. We ask all these mercies in the name of our dear Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And just as uh, before Pastor Samuel comes to speak, uh, he's going to sing uh, a piece uh, for us, uh, a well-known piece that I trust will be a blessing to you. You sing along in your home.
trust and pray that you're keeping well and we're praying for you as and as Reverend Maxwell often says that you pray for us that we might be able to to continue our work working for God in just these sort of difficult days um, but let's come to God's word this this evening and if you have your Bibles can we turn to Acts chapter 1 Acts chapter 1 and then we'll be following on into into Acts chapter 2 we've been studying Acts as you would have known up to about November time and then we switched over to look at winter in the Psalms but we'll come back tonight to, to look over the topic of who can be saved um, who can know forgiveness who can know peace with God who can know the new birth who can experience the deliverance from sin and uh, you just turn with me tonight to Acts chapter 1 as we come to Acts chapter 1 we are mindful of the quote by Abraham Cooper in his classic work on the Holy Spirit. And he said these words, the Holy Spirit leaves no footprints on the sand. Meaning Jesus did leave imprints on the, of his feet on the sand. He, after all, he was God incarnate. He was God in human nature. And therefore when, when his disciples walked with him, they could hear his voice. They could touch his hands, they could watch the sand spilling, covering his feet as he walked on the shore Sea of Galilee. As he walked on the Sea of Galilee, you'll remember that he, um, on, the, on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, reminding them perhaps of the Great Commission in Matthew 28, verse 16, that being one day he would return to his Father in heaven and they, the disciples, would carry on his work. Bottom line, one day he would return, Jesus would return to his father and the disciples would find themselves being the earthly hands, the earthly feet to bring heaven's, God's word to a lost and dying and wayward world. Jesus promised them that greater works than these shall they the disciples do because I go on to my father. In John 14 verse 12. And now suddenly these greater works are suddenly the weight of the mission to bring the gospel to the ends of the earth hits them. It seems an impossible mission which is far above their own capability. I mean they're only 120 strong and their charge and their mission was to, to bring a fan or to fan the flame of the gospel over the whole world. And so Jesus promises them a might for the mission. A might for the mission. Notice verse 8 of chapter 1. But you shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me. Both in Jerusalem and in Judea. And in Samaria. And unto the uttermost parts of the earth. There was a promise of power in verse 8. It says. And ye or you shall will receive. Possess. Our ability, capacity to do what? The key word is witness, to testify of the, the works that they had seen, which they had heard. How would they, how would they carry it through? It was through the persons of power. It says in verse 8, the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost. Jesus says to his disciples, I'm promising you the power for global mission. Through the person of power, the Holy Ghost. Verse 4 is you wait for the promise of the Father. I've got a question for you. How could the Holy Spirit be of more help than Jesus? I'm sure the disciples thought Jesus was very helpful. I'm sure we thought he was, um, we think he's very helpful. But how could, how, could, how could an unseen spirit be any better than someone who, like Jesus, who they could talk with, who they could see? Well, it's a true fact that Jesus had a human nature, which meant he had human limitations. He was constrained. He was restricted by mortal limits. And therefore, Jesus could not be in Jerusalem and Samaria at the same time. However, the Holy Spirit would be like a, a divine wind that would blow upon the whole earth. The Holy Spirit could be in multiple, various, numerous locations at once. The Holy Spirit could be in Africa and the Holy Spirit could be in America. Hence what Jesus meant in Matthew 28 verse 20 by the words of the Great Commission, Lo, I am with you always, was that Jesus would continue his ministry through the Spirit. 
who would empower the apostles to turn the world upside down. Can I encourage you, friend, that that power is still available to you and available to me today? More precisely, God is looking for a man or woman whom he can work through. A man or woman that's available for him to channel the power of the Holy Spirit through in order to fan the flame of the gospel across Northern Ireland and further afield. Would you be that person? Would you be willing to allow God to, to work through you, to see this nation, to see this world glorifying, praising, worshipping God? We will see in chapter 2 the results, the impact of, of 120 people who allowed, who, who said yes uh, to do such. The promise of power, the persons of power, the path of power was the answer is in obedience in verse 4. They are commanded that they should wait and, and prayer in verse 14. Obedience and prayer are the key that unlocks the persons of power, the Holy Ghost. It was through prayer that they found the flame of the gospel, nation after nation, like the, the domino effect. My friends, not only did Jesus promise his disciples might for the mission, but also he promised them a map for the mission. Firstly, the map for the mission was firstly, home first, verse 8. And ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, home first, in Jerusalem. They are to begin in the city of which, uh, of Jerusalem, of which only 50 days earlier had they crucified the Lord Jesus Christ. There, there couldn't be a more difficult place on planet Earth to, to launch a gospel crusade. And yet this is exactly where Jesus says, you start at home first. You evangelize your own people before you branch out into all the world. Secondly, then cross-cultural divides, verse 8, Judea and Samaria. And then thirdly, then the world around you, verse 8, unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And with that statement of verse 8, with Jesus' last words, there was a great event. And the great event is found in verse 9. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and the cloud received him out of, out of their sight. And so here is Jesus. He's just given to them this, this, this might for the mission, this promise of power. And now he's been received up into heaven. And now the disciples, what do they do? They make a, a beeline, a straight line to the upper room in verse 14. It says, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. They held a 10-day prayer meeting. There's a quote that is often used, sometimes used, you might have heard it, that the birth of the church was during a prayer meeting. Not preaching, not singing, but prayer. The, the, the early disciples seemed to know what, what Arthur Pearson, a Christian author, knew, that there was never a spiritual awakening in any country, in any locality, in any neighborhood, that did not begin with united prayer. They seemed to understand that Ian Barrios rightfully put it, the church upon its knees would bring heaven upon earth. At this junction, I want you to see the, firstly the assembly. The assembly in chapter 1, verse 14. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. And so here is the assembly of 120 individuals in the prayer meeting in the upper room. And one disciple be, begins to pray and then stops and then the next right on his heels continues and carries on where he left on. And this continues for, for 10 days. Now, I, I, don't, I think they took stops in between. They had to eat and they had to go to the toilet. But they continued in, in prayer during these, um, opposite these times, one right on the heels of the other. And what are they praying for? They're praying for a power outside of themselves. They're praying for successful advancement of the gospel onto the ends of the earth. They're praying that God would make them faithful witnesses to propel the gospel over all the world. They're, they're praying that spiritually deaf ears would be opened, that eyes that are blinded by the devil would be made to see they're praying that welded, closed, uh, shut doors would be powerfully snapped open. But all in all, they're perhaps praying for a divine visitation 
of the Spirit. That would magnify and glorify and exalt the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And is that not what any prayer meeting should be about? That, that our friends, our neighbours, our, our relatives would come into, 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 into this great salvation that we have, we have experienced and that they then glorify God with their lives. This is the purpose of a prayer meeting, to pray for others the unsaved, that they themselves might glorify, might exalt, might worship God with their lives. The assembly in verse 14, I want us to notice the assembly in chapter 2, verse 1 and 5. Chapter 2, verse 1, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them clothed in tongues like as a fire and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Here were the 120 strong, praying and crying out to God for might for the mission. Now I want you to picture yourself in, in this room, this upper room, where the disciples or apostles are at. And you look around and you see 120 others. You see James and you see Peter, there he is. He's, he's praying, they're crying out to God to come and fill them. And then perhaps there's a, there's a moment of silence, a moment of hush. And then without warning, Peter hears a noise. In fact, the 120 hears a noise, and it's as it's, it's like, no language can describe it, it's, it's like a, a mighty wind. And what's the wind just done? It's, it's burst through the doors. It's rushing and swirling around the building. And what's it signifying? The Holy Spirit's entrance to the earth. Question, who is the Holy Spirit that's mentioned in chapter 1, verse uh, 1 verse 8 and chapter 2 verse uh, 2 and 4. Who is the Holy Spirit or the, the Holy Ghost? Well, the shorter catechism puts it like this. There are three persons in the Godhead. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one God, the same in substance, equal in power and glory. They are three, but they are one. The terms Holy Spirit and Holy Ghost, they mean exactly the same thing. Uh, what, is, what is the Holy Ghost? What is the Holy Spirit's role? It is, is the Holy Ghost who strengthens the believer with supernatural power, Ephesians 3, verse 17. It is the Holy Ghost that brings the believers to remembrance of the, tr of God's, of the truth of God's word, 1 Corinthians 2, 9, verse 14. It is the Holy Ghost that convicts the world of sin and of judgment and righteousness to come, John 16, verse 18. And Jesus says to his disciples, I'm promising you power for the global mission through the person of power, the Holy Ghost. Now what does the person of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, look like? What can we, what can we uh, glean? What can we pull out of this passage to, to understand what, what he is like in his person and his personality? Well, he is, he is like, it says in verse 2, like a mighty wind unseen, mysterious, yet in every sense real. What does the word Holy Spirit speak of? Well, the word holy is a word that belongs solely to God. It, it speaks of uh, something that's sacred, it's pure, it's morally blameless. Uh, the word spirit is a verb meaning to, to breathe, to blow. You'll know that in the Hebrew word for, for um, in, in Genesis, for, 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 for the breath of God is ruach, the breath of God. And you see, the time had, come, had arrived that God would blow the wind of salvation to the door of the, the Jew, but also to the door of the Gentile. The gospel would no longer be for the minority, but the, the gospel would be for the majority. The, the time had come when the gospel would be shared among all nations. This was the day of the Lord. Not only was the Holy Spirit's person, but his personality was displayed in verse 2, or verse 4. He speaks with tongues of fire. 
What do, what do the tongues of fire that were resting over the, the 120 heads represent? Well, it's best understood in, in verses 6. And it says, And when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together, and they were confounded, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. In other words, the Holy Spirit in this upper room gave the disciples the tongue, the tribal language of every nation so that they could tell them of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel would not just be contained now in, in one area to, to one section to, to Jerusalem, but now the disciples, the apostles, the followers of Jesus had the languages to propel the gospel nation after nation like the domino effect to display God's universal love for all of mankind who will have all men to be saved and come unto a knowledge of the truth, 1 Timothy 2 verse 4. So here is the assembly, now charged, now armed, now equipped with the Holy Ghost, part, eager to share the message of the gospel. Where? Well, you remember Jesus has told them, home first. And so, perhaps without hesitation, they maybe run quickly out through the door under the streets of Jerusalem to tell them of Jesus, the mighty to save. That's the assembly. I want us to notice, secondly, the amazement of the crowd. The amazement of the crowd. As they see everybody spilling onto the streets and sharing the gospel, it says in verse 7, and they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not these which speak? Galileans, and how, how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born. And I want you to catch who, were, who was amazed in verse 5. In verse 5 it says it was the Jerusalem Jews and devout, and devout men of every nation. A few, a few quick uh, questions and points to, to answer at this point. Who was, who was staying in Jerusalem? Or why were they staying Sorry, in Jerusalem. It was due to Pentecost. Pentecost was one of the three major feasts of the Jewish calendar, of all which all Hebrew meals over the age of 13 were expected to celebrate it in the holy city of Jerusalem for one week, Exodus 23, verse 14. Who were they? In verse 5 it says they were devout men or devout Jews. Now, now Dr. Luke doesn't tell us whether they were Pharisees or Sadducees or Zealots, but what he does tell us is these were devout men, meaning they were devoted, they were pious, they were God-fearing to the, to the Torah, to the, the Jewish scriptures, and they had converged, they had flooded the city of Jerusalem. What was the devoted Jewish belief? This is important to, to grasp. They believed there is only one God, and that one God had established a covenant or a special agreement just with them, no one else. And yet this was to change because the time had come of the, the new covenant, the time had come when, when the gospel would not just be contained to the Jew or to the few, but the gospel would be opened up to the whosoever. The time was coming when, G, when God would open heaven's front doors to whosoever. To enter in. The time had come when God was not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Second Peter 3 verse 9. Acts chapter 2 is one of the most significant junctions in history. Because it, it openly displays the, the day that heaven came down and opened the, the floodgates for the whosoever. Yet at this point, many Jews were blind to this fact. I remember Jerusalem at this stage was a hive of activity. It was full of different people groups and um, from all nations. You'll get, a, you'll get a taste of that in verses 9 and 11. It says Perindians and Medes and dwellers of Mesopotamia and in Asia. In fact, there's 15 countries um, that are mentioned here. And all of a sudden, these 15 nations or people groups hear a, a loud noise 
that captures their attention and they, they looked around and perhaps they saw 120 Christians spilling onto the streets, sharing the news of Jesus and their message was causing ripples on the faith pond in Jerusalem. This, this person was perhaps responding to the gospel and this person was responding to the gospel and people were looking on at how the ripples of the gospel was catching effect on people. And what was their response? Verse 7. It says, and they were all amazed and marveled. And what seemed to amaze them the most was verse 7, whenever they said, are these not the Galileans? After all, it was the Galileans that were looked upon as the unlearned, as the unschooled, as the uneducated, the sort of rough and tumble type, the, the fishermen. And yet here are these unlearned, unschooled, untaught Galileans. Speaking in multiple languages to the educated, to the well-versed, to the well-schooled, to the well-taught Judean. I want to encourage the one from this passage who perhaps is training to be a missionary or would like to one day become a missionary. And you're fearful. Fearful about learning a language that perhaps you've never even heard before. Don't be. If God can take the rough and tumble, the uneducated crew like these early disciples and equip them, then surely God can do the same for you. It's been often said, I was thinking of it this morning, God doesn't call the equipped, but he equips the call. And surely if God is calling you, then God can do exactly the same for you as he done for the early disciples. So the crowd had seen were floored. They were dumbstruck. They were staggered. They were amazed at what was happening. And Dr. Luke tells us who all were amazed in those verses of 9 to 11. These lands, they represented uh, lands outside of Roman control. They represented lands that were difficult to evangelize, that perhaps lands that had, had never heard of the, the Jewish faith. And on this day, however, the Holy Spirit had brought the, the world, as it seemed, to Jerusalem to signify that God was intent to overcome the obstacle to communicate God's truth and carry out God's plan of redemption to the whole world. Indeed, Jesus promised then to go into all the world and to preach the gospel. And now the, the world had come to Jerusalem to signify that God was going to start a domino effect of Christianity across the whole world. No longer was the gospel going to be for a few. But the gospel would be for the whosoever. Whosoever would call upon the name of the Lord. Yet the crowd's amazement led to confusion. And their only reasonable conclusion as they're looking around and seeing, seeing uh, these 120 uneducated Galileans uh, speaking in a different language was that they were full of wine, they were drunk. Notice verse 13. Others mocking said, these men are full of wine. The assembly. Secondly, the amazement. And then thirdly, Peter's answer in verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words, for these are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. Peter's answer. Now that this word standing in verse 14 is much more than just casually getting up off your seat. It means he, he got up and took a, a firm stand. He wasn't slouching, but he stood like the foundation of a house. He was immovable. He was established. He, he was authoritative stand to present the word of God. He had something to say and he had to say. Perhaps he was flanked by the other 11 as he lifted his voice, meaning he raised his voice to be heard. He projected his voice. And what does he say? Well, he answers the crowd's question of verse 12. What meaneth this? Why is all of this happening? 
So Peter the spokesman, you get this sense of, of Peter's a humorous type of man, um, because he says in, in, in verse 15, for these are not drunken as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. Now the third hour of the day was 9 a.m. And so Peter's sort of, you get this, this sense that he's, he's saying people aren't naturally liquored up, aren't naturally do seen double at this time. It's, it's nine o'clock in the morning. Who would be, who would be, who would 120 people be drunk? And then Peter comes with this thunderous statement. Here he comes with the mandate from heaven. Here is, here is this man with, now speaking with a loud, clear, crisp voice to explain why heaven had come down, why these 120 people were speaking in languages um, that were, were foreign to them. And he says to them, it was a fulfillment of prophecy. It is a fulfillment of prophecy. Verse 16. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapour of smoke. Verse 20, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord shall come. Here's Peter and he's standing with authority and he's presenting a Bible saturated, a, a scripturally soaked message. And he starts with quoting the prophet Joel and then moves into Psalm 16 and Psalm 110. And it appears that, that Peter knows uh, this all from memory. It appears that Peter had stored up the word of God in his mind. In the context, you can read it of Joel chapter 2. I've, I've read it. It's a call to repentance. And the most important primary principle phrase of this prophecy that Joel speaks is the words of verse 17 that, that Peter reiterated again. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Joel, he makes mention to the last days, which we know that the last days began with Christ's appearance to earth, and it will be ended with his appearing, reappearing. Yet in between Joel promised, yet, yet in Joel, God promised that his, that his Holy Spirit would breathe upon all flesh. It would breathe upon the whole human race. It would breathe upon the, the Jew and the, the Gentile. It would, it would be no longer for the Jew. It would be no longer for the few. But now the 120 would take the gospel through the power of the Holy Spirit and propel it like a domino effect, nation across nation, upon who? Upon all flesh. Upon every human being that had ears that could hear, who had good eyes that could see. That was fulfilled and that's been fulfilled. And yet there's part of Joel's prophecy that some might say is yet to be fulfilled. In verses 19, it says, and there will be um, signs in the earth beneath and blood and fire and vapor and smoke and the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord shall come. Joel said there will be wonders in heaven and, and earth and signs on the earth would precede the, the Lord's arrival to, to judge the world in Matthew 24, verse 36. Jesus also emphasizes that. And yet I say to you, you know, are we not seeing those signs worked out today? Are we not seeing these days that Joel spoke about, those days that Jesus spoke about? Those calamities with viruses, those persecution of Christians across the globe, the famines and earthquake. Is, are we not living the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy? In fact, I personally believe that this generation, um, or perhaps the generation before me, will see the coming in the clouds and we don't know we can't speculate 
But the sign seemed to be in the sky that the king is coming, that the king is coming very soon. Yet who will Jesus come for? Who will Jesus return for? Well, Peter gives us the answer, and fourthly, his assurance in verse 21. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Joel's assurance was that there is a salva- that there is salvation not just for the Jew, not just for the few, but that it was available, it was open, it was free to all who would turn to Jesus Christ by faith and repent of their sins. And here is the assurance given by Peter on the day to all mankind, verse 21, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so perhaps you're listening to this and you're just new to the faith. Perhaps you've only recently got saved and you're lacking assurance. Has God really done this work within my heart? I want you to read verse 21. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you have called in faith and repented of your sins and asked Jesus into your life, the word of God reminds us that you shall be saved. The word of God also reminds us in Romans chapter 10 that if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our hearts that God has raised him from the dead, we shall be saved so often as we tell others about what has happened in our life. That assurance becomes even more real to us. The word whosoever in verse 21, it means whosoever, anyone, any person that calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Saved from what? Saved from hell and saved unto heaven. Saved from um, damnation. Saved unto deliverance. Saved from a, a life of ruin and saved unto a life of rewards with God in heaven. And so here we come full circle to the question, does God desire all people to be saved or who can be saved? Well, in authority of Acts chapter 2 and indeed the whole canon of Scripture, we can read in verse 21, it says, And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans chapter 10 verse 12 says, For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile, Greek, for the same Lord over, is, is rich over to all, unto all that call upon him. So what should our response be knowing this fact? Knowing that the gospel is available, not to the minority, but to the majority. Knowing that the gospel is not just for a a few, but the, the gospel is for the whosoever. How should we as Christians respond to this passage this this evening? Well, perhaps Elton Trueblood summed it up best in his book, Incendiary Fellowship. He says that every Christian ought to be an incendiary device. An incendiary device is often like a tube with a fuse and when it's lit it creates an inferno of fire, it creates a blaze uh, around it. And so Elton suggests that every Christian ought to be so fired up, fired up with the Holy Spirit living within them, the Holy Ghost living within them. They're so fired up that Jesus Christ could return at any moment. They're so fired up that this gospel is for for whosoever, that whosoever can be prepared for Jesus returning. And so that every Christian should be an incendiary device going into their neighborhoods, going to their friends and their family in these days to fan the flame of the gospel into homes and to tell them that of Jesus the mighty to see Tell them that they need to prepare. Tell them that the day of the Lord is coming when he will return in the clouds for his own and anyone who is not ready will be left behind. Christian, this is the message that we need to be telling today. We need to be incendiary devices, creating sparks in our families. 
that will create an inferno of fire, a revival across our whole land. James Montgomery Boyce said from Acts chapter 3, the disciples started to speak of Jesus and little fire sprung up. And yet pretty soon there would be a raging fire of revival across the whole world. And pretty soon there would be a raging fire of revival across the whole world. Where did it start? It started with 120 incendiary devices who boldly went onto the streets of their hometown and told the people of Jesus. They created sparks that turned into a, a flame, a worldwide movement called Christianity. I wonder this afternoon, Christian, do we need to be incendiary devices? Do we need to be sharing the gospel knowing um, that Jesus is coming back. We need to be sharing the gospel more rapidly, more fearlessly to those that do not know him. Do we not need to create sparks that could create an inferno of revival across our land? Let's be incendiary devices today. Let's share the news of this universal gospel today. And while we do, let's thank God for sending Jesus to die for our sins, not only for our sin, but for the sins of the world. This is the message of the gospel, that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let's pray. Father, we thank you just for your word. Your word is a lamp unto our feet. And Lord, for those today that are tonight that have known darkness, even in their own souls, to know that they're not ready, to know that they're not saved, I pray the light of this gospel message would help them to understand that they can call upon the name of the Lord and they can be saved. They can know tonight for sure that they have that their account is settled with God, that they have no, for, they can know forgiveness of sins, they can know peace with God. And yet for those we pray for that have recently become Christians, that have recently responded to the message of the gospel, that have recently invited you into their lives, I just pray you'll give them that assurance they need, that peace that they need in their own souls, to know that they have called upon you, and you've promised them that they will be saved, not might, but will. We pray then for Christians, those that perhaps are more established in the faith, that we would not have concrete feet, but that we would be in century devices, going into our neighborhoods, going into our families, and lighting sparks that would sparks of the gospel, sharing the gospel that they might become a raging one day called a raging inferno of revival. And Father, we pray you'll do it again. At what we have seen in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 3, that we might see again before you return. Our prayer, O oh Father, is do it again, Lord. Do it again. And so we continue praising you and glorifying your great name. In Jesus' name.